Grandma gently lifted the alien's hands and put a t-shirt on it, saying it looked more natural this way. Little did she know, this kind gesture would later help she avoid a calamity. That day, a thief entered the house and was discovered by Sandy, who was then knocked to the ground by the intruder, miles away. The alien witnessed the scene, and the alien, a few kilometers away, saw the scene, only to see its head rapidly blue warming up, its eyes slightly chesty, then the blue slowly faded. Soon, the police arrived at Sandy's house. Sandy was fine, but the thief died from a sudden explosion of his head. With no evidence to prove Sandy had killed the thief, the police did not detain her. After handling the situation, Sandy rushed to Milton's house and hugged the alien, weeping. Milton had never expected that taking in an alien would bring such drastic changes to his life. A few nights ago, Milton was awakened by a loud noise and opened the back door to find, to his shock, a UFO had crashed in his backyard. He tried calling the police, but the operator thought it was a prank and hung up. He also tried calling his daughter, but only reached her voicemail. Milton opened the door again and found the alien barely alive, not daring to touch it and unsure of what to do. Milton mentioned the incident at the next village meeting, however, no one believed him, thinking he was just a senile old man talking nonsense. So, the UFO and the alien just lay in the yard for three days. That evening, the alien regained some strength and slightly raised its head as if asking Milton for help. Seeing its pitiful state, Milton covered it with a blanket and thoughtfully placed a cup of water next to it. The next morning, Milton found the alien had moved to the edge of the bushes, seemingly cold. Although afraid, Milton wanted to help and gestured from two meters away to invite the alien inside. You want to come inside because it's warmer in here. Milton thoughtfully prepared a plate of food, but the alien only ate the apples. Seeing this, Milton immediately went to the supermarket and bought a large quantity of apples. When the cashier asked him about it, he openly said they were for the alien at home, which left the cashier astonished. Back at home, Milton introduced the alien to all the household amenities, but the alien said nothing and just followed Milton around. Milton kept talking non-stop, assuming that the alien understood. The arrival of the little guy seemed to add a touch of color to Milton's solitary life. At least he had someone to talk to and could share his thoughts. However, Milton didn't know that NASA had detected an unidentified object entering Earth's atmosphere and was actively searching for the UFO. His bulk purchase of apples also caught his daughter's attention. While shopping, the cashier relayed what Milton had said to his daughter in full detail. She immediately rushed to find Milton, insisting on taking him for a medical checkup. Milton repeatedly emphasized that he wasn't sick, but his daughter said that only a doctor's confirmation could prove that. Just then, the phone rang, and Milton's daughter had to leave for an urgent matter. Thus, Milton missed another chance to prove the existence of the alien to others. In the afternoon, Sandy came over to borrow a printer but was shocked and terrified upon seeing the alien. Oh, good Christ, what the f*** that? You remember the spaceship that crashed in my yard? This is the little man who came out of it. This is Sandy. She's an acquaintance of mine. She quickly became excited, realizing that this was proof that Earth wasn't alone in the universe. Sandy advised Milton not to tell anyone, fearing that they and the alien would end up being captured and studied, just like in the movies. From that day on, Sandy also found a confidant in the alien, often coming over to vent her feelings. Although she seemed happy in her conversations, it reflected her loneliness, as she could talk for ages to an alien who couldn't speak back. One day, the alien drew a picture of a fox and left it on the table. Milton didn't understand what it meant, thinking the alien simply wanted to give him a picture, but as he walked out into the yard, he realized the alien had started repairing the UFO. Milton remarked, So you started fixing your ship. It must be tough being stuck on another planet. I hope you can repair it soon. In the afternoon, Milton was tricked by his daughter into taking an intelligence test. After a series of childish tests, Milton felt angry and betrayed by his daughter's lack of trust. He had a big argument with her and stormed off, walking several miles home in a fit of rage. Milton finds an alien to confide in, saying that his daughter mistakenly thinks he's sick, and even thinks he's lost his ability to take care of himself. Could it be because he's come to her a few times to fix his TV? Even if the alien understood, it couldn't respond, leaving Milton's frustrations unresolved. Milton ended up calling his son, who worked out of town. However, after not seeing each other for 10 years, the father and son were awkward and distant. The conversation left Milton feeling even more depressed, highlighting the loneliness of an elderly man living alone, with no one to confide in. Even when he did, there was no one who could understand him. So, 
Milton and Sandy started treating the alien like a grandchild. They bought it the best apples, gifted it trendy t-shirts, and even gave it a cute name, Jules. Meanwhile, another lonely old woman, Joyce, was watching the news. The broadcast mentioned a satellite crash in her town. With NASA unable to track its exact location, a $10,000 reward was offered for any leads. Joyce immediately thought of what Milton had said about a UFO crashing in his backyard. That night, she went to Milton's house and found them having dinner with the alien. She quickly rang the doorbell, seeing that it was Joyce. Milton rushed to hide Jules upstairs. How are you? I seen the alien. Oh my goodness, it's a goddamn extraterrestrial. Joyce, with her lively personality, tried to touch Jules, but Milton stopped her. After some discussion, they all agreed to keep the secret. At that moment, Jules handed over another drawing, this time with seven foxes. There had been several similar pictures, and they believed Jules was trying to convey a message. On this day, Joyce received a strange call from a person who claimed to be sent by the community to chat with her. This was a suggestion that Joyce had made to the mayor many times before. Hoping that some young people could be sent to chat with the elderly living alone, her suggestion hadn't been accepted. So she was thrilled and unsuspecting when the man showed up. As they chatted, the man asked to use the bathroom but instead sneaked upstairs to steal Sandy's jewelry. This led to the opening scene, where Jules saved Sandy's life with a blue light. Sandy hadn't seen her children in three years, and Jules saving her life made her feel a long-lost warmth. The three realized that Jules had no ill intentions towards them and even considered them as his own. That day, the four of them had afternoon tea together. Suddenly, they smelled something strange, like rotting meat. Stepping outside, they discovered a dead cat with visible tire marks, suggesting it had been run over and brought back by Jules. A spaceship. It turned out the drawings weren't of foxes but cats. With the appearance of a dead cat, the number of cats in the drawings had changed from seven to six, alongside a spaceship. This implied that Jules needed six more dead cats to start the spaceship. As odd as it sounded, it wasn't entirely illogical, considering Jules had only eaten apples and nothing else. Milton called his daughter, who worked at an animal hospital, to see if she could get some cat corpses. However, this bizarre request only led to more misunderstandings, and they didn't find any leads. So, Milton and Sandy went out to look for cats themselves. Meanwhile, the police hadn't given up on investigating Sandy. They found the thief's death suspicious and sent officers to follow her. Sandy's driving at 20 miles per hour made them even more suspicious. When she stopped the car, the officers were dumbfounded by what they saw. By the end of the day, Milton and Sandy had only found two cats, leaving four more to go. Joyce confidently said she would take care of it and managed to find three more the next day. As they discussed how to find the last cat, the doorbell rang. Joyce peeked through the door and sensed trouble. The three were momentarily stunned, unsure of what to do. Luckily, the agents left after waiting for a while. However, they knew they couldn't continue like this. They needed to find the last cat soon. Milton makes a very inappropriate suggestion at this point, saying that he should bring Joyce's cat over. After all, it can't hear, see, or walk anymore, and it's at an age where it's going to die. Joyce says she treats it like her own child. How can Milton say such a thing? Though she said that, Joyce's heart wavered. The cat had been sick for a long time, and extending its life might just be prolonging its suffering. After much contemplation, Joyce decided to let the cat go peacefully. Finally, they placed seven dead cats in front of the spaceship. Jules covered them with a silver cloth. And suddenly, the cats moved together, merging with the cloth and turning into a red gemstone. Jules placed the gemstone into the spaceship, which immediately powered up. As the spaceship started, NASA detected its location and sent agents to capture it. Jules was about to leave Earth, and the three elders felt reluctant to say goodbye. Joyce gave Jules a crystal ball as a memento of this beautiful planet, while Joyce gifted a hand-knitted sweater. As for Milton, he hadn't prepared any gifts, and improvised by pulling out his ID card and giving it to Jules, hoping that Jules would remember what he looked like. Unexpectedly, Jules gestured an invitation, just as Milton had invited him into the house. He was inviting the three elders to leave with him. At that moment, the phone rang. 
It was Milton's daughter, not calling about the medical checkup but to remind him it was time for a haircut. She planned to take him for a haircut on Saturday, followed by dinner together. This call brought Milton back to reality, reminding him of his responsibilities on Earth. Then came a rapid knock on the door, the agents had arrived. With no choice left, they followed Jules onto the spaceship. Within seconds, they found themselves in a desolate area, the three were confused, wondering if they had arrived on another planet already. Sandy checked her phone and saw there was still a signal. Looking around, they realized they were still on Earth, surrounded by familiar packaging. It turned out Jules had just taken them to a safe place. Milton knelt down and said his final goodbye to Jules. He said he was glad Jules had invited him to its home, and Milton was eager to see what its homeworld looked like, but he's been on this planet his whole life. And there are still people and things here that are worth staying for. And he's decided to stay here. 